Hi, I'm Ben Christian, lead anchor of H-E-N-L-E-Y News. And this is Ben's partner and co-anchor, Michael Cha. A few weeks ago, our tech team finally invented the time machine. With this machine, it allows us to go back in time so we can cast the news from the past. Fellow reporter Brendan Riddle was sent through the machine and he has gotten a hold of a few interviews from some important people. These people have a big part and involvement in the history and making of our country. But before we send you off to our famous reporter Riddle, we want to give you a little newscast. The Magna Carta. The Magna Carta, Carta was a document that King of, King of England, King John, was forced into signing. King John was forced into signing the charter because it greatly reduced the power he held as King of England and allowed for the, for the formation of a powerful parliament. The Magna Carta became the basis for English citizens' rights. The purpose of the Magna Carta was to curb the king and make him governed by the old English laws that came from Normans. The Magna Carta was a collection of 37 English laws, which was some were copied and recollected, and some were old and some were new. The Magna Carta demonstrated that the power of the king could be limited by a written grant. And now, Ben will talk about the Continental Congress. The Continental Congress was colonies that became the governing body of the United States during the American Revolution. The Congress met from 1774 to 1789 in three incarcerations. The first call for a convention was made over issues of mounting taxation without representation in Parliament because of the British blockade. Though at first somewhat divided on issues concerning independence and a break from crown rule, the new Congress would come to issue a Declaration of Independence and a Constitution and were proclaim the name United States of America as the name of the new name of the nation. It was established a continental army also endure a war with Britain. Before fusion of independent constitutional government was fully recognized among the American colonies. And now we're gonna send you to Riddle to our interview with John Locke. Hey guys, it's Brandon Riddle. I'll be with John Locke, a seventeenth century English philosopher. Hey John, how's it going? Hey there Brendan. So tell me what makes you such an important philosopher? Well, my ideas formed the beginning of liberal democracy and influenced the American and French Revolution. What did you contribute to philosophy? Well, I invented a theory called empiricism, which basically explains the limits of what we can understand about the nature of reality. Wow, that's really cool. Can you tell me a little more about Sure, sure. I believe that our understanding of reality ultimately comes from what we have experienced through our senses. Now, uh, John, can you give me some of your political thoughts? Alright. I think that all people are born equal and that education can free people from the harshness of tyranny. Okay, well, um, now we're wondering, like, how, what are your thoughts on government? Well, I believe that government has a moral responsibility to guarantee the people's power over their own rights. <clears throat> That's interesting. Well, for my last question, I'd like to know what you have done to express your views. Well, I just published a very successful piece called Essay Concerning Human Understanding, which I hope will help philosophers for a long time. I made many other pieces, and I just hope each of them can come to great use in the future. Now that sounds good. I'm sure your pieces and thoughts will be very helpful in the future. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Brendan. Now back to you guys in the studio. Hi guys, Brendan again. I'm here with Baron de Montesquieu, a French philosopher, born in 1689. Hey there, Baron. Hi, Brendan. So, Baron, tell me about some of the, your beliefs. Okay, well, I believe that all things are made up of rules or laws that never change. I study these laws scientifically, hoping that if people have knowledge of the laws of government, the problems of society would reduce and improve human life. That's very interesting. Now, would you like to tell me more about the government of your time? Well, as I see it, there are three types of government. A monarchy, which is ruled by a king or a queen. A republic, ruled by an elected leader. And a despotism, which is ruled by a dictator. And which form of government do you believe should we, we should use? Well, I don't really believe in any of those three. The government that I believe that is the best is elected by the people. Actually, I believe in democracy. Where the people have the power, but maintaining the right of balance of power is crucial for success in this government style. Democracy? Tell me more. Well, I believe that England's divided power between the king, parliament, and judges displays my ideal government, democracy, and separation of powers idea greatly. 
Do you have any other beliefs you'd like to share? Uh, sure, I have plenty. I believe in slavery. I don't feel like all people are equal. I think women are weaker than men and should always obey their husbands. But I do believe that women can rule in the government. Slavery, that's interesting. Wow, very strong belief. That concludes our interview. Nice talking to you, Barone. Thank you, guys. All right, back to you guys in the studio. John Locke was an interesting character, wasn't he? Yes, he was, and so was Baron de Montesquieu. Both of them were two very fascinating people. John Locke is probably one of my favorite philosophers yet asked. And now uh, we'll go to Riddle and Cash for a field report on Thomas Jefferson and the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration of Independence claimed our independence from England. The committee that wrote the piece consisted of Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, Robert R. Livingston, and Roger Sherman. It was adopted on July 4th, 1776. One key thing people don't know about the piece is that it was also a persuasion for the citizens of the colonies to want to break away from England. Thank you. Thomas Jefferson wished to be remembered for three achievements in his life. One, serving as governor of Virginia, being the U.S. Minister of France, and Secretary of State under George Washington. Also, he was elected to the Second Continental Congress, where he was chosen to prepare the Declaration of Independence. Thank you for the field report, Brendan and uh, Cash. I just can't imagine what our world would be like if we did not declare independence from England. Can you imagine our world without one of our forefathers, Thomas Jefferson? We like, we like to take this time to tell you and remind you the freedom of press, that you are allowed to print or write anything you desire as long as it's true. And, of course, that's part of the First Amendment of the Bill of Rights. And now we go to Ben. The English Bill of Rights was passed by Parliament December 16, 1689. These ideas about rights re reflected those of political thinker John Locke, and they quickly became popular in England. The Bill of Rights laid out certain basic laws and for all Englishmen. These rights continue to apply today, not only in England and Wales, but each have their own jurisdictions. Thank you, Ben and Cho, for that awesome newscast on Bill of Rights and Freedom of Press. Now, I'm here to talk about the rights of citizens and colonists. It seems they had three sections of rights. First, the rights of colonists, they had the right to life, liberty, and the right to property. This was called the duty of self-preservation and commonly referred to as the first law of nature. They also had rights as Christians to worship any god. And they had rights of the colonists as subjects and they had a right to personal security, personal liberty, and private property. Thank you, Eric, uh, our field reporter. Uh, Great field reporter. Being a uh, citizen back in the days would be quite interesting. Yes, it would be. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> now, we're going to go back to Eric, and he's going to talk about the Boston Tea Party, and what is that, Ben? Taxation without representation. I'm here to talk about taxation without representation. This, this and the Boston Tea Party connect. This is where the colonist tar and feathered tax collector for imposes taxing forced upon them. Did I mess up by a lot? Did I mess up by a long shot? Brendan doesn't know when to stop. Right, no, just keep it and I can, we can cut it out. I'll just go when I'm ready. Keep it acting. I'm here to talk about taxation without representation. This is when the colonists tar and feathered the tax collector for imposing taxes on them without having representation. This was these taxes were a part of the Townsend Acts. Um, they claimed they had no representation in the taxes, and therefore England had no right in taxing them. Now the Boston Tea Party ties into this. The Boston Tea Party is when a bunch of colonists refuse to pay the taxes imposed by the Townsend Act. And then they throw them together as a tax collector. <laughs> then, when, the tea, when three tea ships arrived in Boston Harbor, the furious Boston citizens, some dressed as Native Americans, ran onto the ships and broke some tea crates and dumped them into Boston Joe and Ben. 
What an excellent field report by Eric Cronin on the Boston Tea Party. I just think it's fascinating how they dress the white Native Americans. And taxation without representations. Boy, I hate taxes. What about you, Ben? Woo, who doesn't? Well, folks, that's it for tonight on H-E-N-L-E Watt News. I hope, hope you enjoyed the show, and we'll see you tomorrow night. And as we send Cash Garner back to the 1960s and the early 1970s. Thank you, and have a good, good night. Bump, bump. Bum, 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 bum,